I'd like to call to order, this is the City of Bloomington Common Council uh, meeting for uh, the Climate Action and Resilience Committee. Um, and am I speaking close enough to this microphone? Is this about correct? Okay. So we have cats here tonight, and this is a um, continuation of our um, evaluation of gas-powered lawn equipment for phase-out which is a goal that's within our climate action plan. But before we start talking about that, let's just have some brief introductions. So I'm Dave Rollo, City Council District 4, and I'm chairing this committee. Matt Flaherty, at-large representative, also a committee member. Ron Smith uh, from District 3, uh, uh, committee member. And I'm Isabel Piedmont-Smith, uh, City Council District 5, member of the committee. And we have Stephen Lucas here who is our uh, council attorney. Um, and you will need to uh, sp speak at the microphone. I'm not suggesting you move here up yet, but when you do, would you please introduce yourselves and uh, so we know who you are. Um, so this committee has been discussing this topic and it is, as I said, a component of our climate action and resilience uh, plan. Um, and so this committee is meeting in order to evaluate the phase out of uh, leaf blowers um, in the city uh, as per the plan. And the plan uh, discusses this, uh, this type of um, strategy under TL1L, uh, and you can find that in the packet. I believe people have this packet that's been distributed to you. And the, the goal is to reduce citywide off-road and lawn equipment annual emissions to below 35,000 metric tons. Uh, emissions from off-road equipment like construction and lawn equipment comprise a significant portion of fossil fuel consumption in Bloomington. Reduction of fossil fuel off-road equipment use is associated with improved emissions, emissions as well as improved air quality, particularly for the users of the equipment. And then it links a study from Edmunds.com, which actually leads to a page that doesn't exist, but I found the page, so we'll, that will be, need to be corrected. Um, but, and then it goes into actions, and the actions are to replace city off-road uh, and lawn equipment with electric and low carbon fuel alternative options, uh, and developing incentive programs uh, for, uh, for the city and the community. So um, in our last meeting, we uh, sought to now get community input, and um, so we invited uh, participants to uh, submit, to, to engage in a poll, and the poll is uh, in, in your packet, um, and I'll refer to the poll in a few minutes, and uh, we contacted a number of lawn care firms in the community. Uh, I, I don't know if that was an exhaustive list, but staff reached out. And uh, fortunately, and I appreciate uh, your response to these questions, and I assume some of the people here tonight responded, and we can go through the answers to these uh, in a moment. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll invite you to, to comment further, and I'd like to have a discussion because what we would like to find out is, um, you know, what, what this uh, amounts to in terms of, um, you know, uh, whether a trans how a transition would occur and what kind of burden it is to your particular uh, uh, commercial interest. Uh, we'll also open it up to public. We have people on Zoom, I, I understand, that would like to comment too. Um, so let's go move to comments from staff, if any. Uh, we were going to uh, hopefully have Adam Wason here tonight, but he will not be attending, um, who was to provide a list of equipment, uh, but I understand city staff is not here this evening. Mr. Lucas, could you? We, I, I will mention we have Tim Street here from the uh, Parks Department. Uh, Mr. Street oh, uh, was able to provide an inventory of parks equipment that was included in your packet. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Wason apologized for not being available tonight, but did provide a list of equipment, uh, gas-powered equipment that Public Works uh, currently has, uh, is still working on, a, on an inventory of their electric equipment. Uh, generally speaking, he, he shared with me that they are working on transitioning their equipment um, and expect to make uh, several purchases this year for many of the smaller handheld uh, types of equipment. 
Uh, he mentioned, I believe, the uh, larger chainsaws and the uh, surface grinders and uh, other concrete saws that they have as equipment that uh, they didn't think they'd be able to uh, uh, replace uh, currently uh, this year. Uh, said many of the issues they had experienced in the last year or two uh, in um, uh, replacing their gas powered equipment had to do with supply chain issues, uh, just availability. Um, uh, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else you shared. I, I, I think that was everything. Uh, Mr. Street may be able to comment uh, from uh, Parks uh, if he's uh, able to come up to the table if he wants to add anything. Yes, Mr. Street, please. Um, and, and you responded to the, the poll as well. Um, so, yeah. I did, yeah. Uh, so, just briefly, I would say, really, for the last three or four years, we've been making efforts to replace uh, gas powered equipment with battery equipment where we can. Um, definitely have some similar feelings to Mr. Wason that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. our urban forestry crews, the larger chainsaws, some of those things we don't feel uh, are quite there yet with the technology. But what we have seen in the last three years is that um, the technology seems to be coming a long way. Um, battery life seems to be getting better. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're able to rely on battery powered equipment more and more. Uh, I think we're at about 20% battery now. Um, we try to tell our staff to grab those first and rely on those first. And then the gas powered equipment is more of a backup. Uh, probably most significantly this year, we are getting three uh, zero turn battery mowers. Uh, we haven't felt like the technology has quite been there in recent years to, to try that out, but we got a demo of one um, in coordination with the ESD department last year at Switchyard Park and felt like the time was right uh, to, to give that a try for a few locations that we have. Um, I will say Parks does rely a lot on outside contractors uh, for mowing as well. Uh, a lot of our parks are mowed through a contract, um, but we are trying, you will see the zero turn mowers in use uh, when they arrive this spring at uh, Rose Hill Cemetery, uh, Bryan Park, and at Switchyard Park. So we'll be giving those a try. Um, they do come with, you know, we've had to do some extra electric work as well in the places where those will be stored and charged uh, to set up the appropriate um, voltage and amperage and separate breakers for the chargers um, to charge those. So. Um, you know, we consider this a, a real trial run of that technology to see uh, how it's going to work for us. Um, but overall, we're we're increasingly pleased with how battery equipment operates for, you know, custodial staff when they go to a park and need to blow out a shelter um, and things like that. Uh, string trimmers have been working pretty well. Um, the backpack blowers have been working pretty well. It's some of the more heavy duty equipment that we're still feeling out whether we feel like it's up to the performance standards for us at this point. Great. Um, so you distinguish between chainsaws, heavy duty, lawnmowers, bush hogs as being the most difficult to switch to electric, mm -hmm. but you've had good success with blowers and trimmers, you say. Um, yeah, thus far, um, okay. yes, I will say, you know, a, a lot of our use, the heaviest use is probably in our uh, landscaping crews, our urban green space team. Um, even then, they're frequently moving around to a lot of different locations, so it's not like they're out there, you know, leaf blowing for mm -hmm. eight straight hours or anything like that. But mm -hmm. um, we've got some chargers that can move around with them as well, um, and they can be charging kind of in between um, tasks that they're doing. And when you refer to a phase out of two to four years, are you referring to all that equipment, or are you referring just to the leaf blowers? Definitely leaf blower, string trimmer, some of that lighter duty items. Um, maybe not some of the heavier duty, like the, the long bar chainsaws and stuff that the urban forestry crew needs to use to take down. Uh, but then again, we'll, we'll just have to see where the technology goes. Okay. Um, why don't we have the committee ask questions of Mr. Street, sure. if you have any. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for this information. Um, can you estimate roughly like what portion of the work is, is done in-house with, with parks versus contracted out? For for mowing, yeah, sure. That is is so that the main area? Mowing would be the main area yeah. that we contract out. Yes, um, of course, urban forestry. Um, when we have trees that are too hazardous or require technical equipment um, mm -hmm. that our street department or our urban forestry crews can't handle, that gets contracted out. That's a little harder to represent as a percentage. Mm -hmm. um, for mowing, I would say, without looking up the acreage, I would say we mow twenty percent and we rely on a contract mower to mow about 80% of our park green space. Okay, and have you, um, 
have you had any preliminary conversations with uh, contractors about electrification of their own fleets, or is that not something we have not? No. Yet? Okay. Um, another question or two. That's okay. Yeah. <coughs> also, um, with respect to uh, you know using equipment continuously for for some hours or something like that, some of the handheld devices. Do you all rely? Do you rotate batteries? Do you bring extra batteries and, and rotate them out? Charge. Yeah. How, how does that? Um, so does that we. Work? We do have some extra batteries, so they'll set out with more batteries, obviously, so then when one runs down, um, I'm gonna say cemeteries actually might be the place where they get the most continuous use, mm -hmm. because when that crew goes out, there's a lot to do in the cemetery. There's a lot of string trimming in a cemetery around graves. Um, and they've reported pretty good success um, with these where they will have, you know, set out with an extra battery, They'll change it, they'll put the one back on the charger, and they're able to manage back and forth between those pretty well um, and get good life on the charge. Um, we wanted to try one of the zero turn battery mowers in the cemetery because we feel also like that's one of the most, there in Bryant Park, we feel are two of the um, most continuous use locations we'll have for mowing to, to test those out. Okay. And uh, could you speak at all to your experiences so far with um, maintenance and operations, like ongoing in terms of what's required? Uh, maybe thoughts about uh, cost differential and life cycle costs, how, how that sure. factors into your thinking. Um, like upfront cost differential and then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, upfront cost is, is much higher, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, Across all categories, including like trimmers and blowers? I think so. I, I We're getting ready to do a purchase again this year and we'll see how that compares. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it depends if you're getting a top of the line brand or if you're getting you know, um, a, a lower brand. Um, so, so definitely much more upfront cost. Um, you know, the mowers that we just got, that's kind of freshest in my mind. Um, I want to say they were maybe not quite twice as expensive as a typical gas zero turn power mower would be. Um, but looking at the savings and the lifespan, at least how it's projected, you know, and, and we're relying on some um, numbers that we have not been able to test yet. Um, it looks like, you know, at about that five or six year mark, um, you would see that sort of come around um, and start to realize um, the, the savings. Now, that's a long time for a mower, too. You can put a lot of hours on it in that time. Um, there is a lot less mechanical to them. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's, you know, there's no filters, there's no oil, there's no a lot of, you know, maintenance parts and exchanging things. It's it's kind of they're either, they're either running or they're not. Mm -hmm. um, so... We have not had ours long enough that we've experienced much failure. Um, I said we've been phasing this in over the last three years. We've been buying a few pieces a year and replacing and seeing how it goes. Um, and so far, so good. But it, it is definitely a, a heavier upfront cost. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other committee members? Mr. Street, thank you for the information. Um, I'm going to follow up on <clears throat> Councilman Flaherty. Is can you just say how much those uh, zero turns cost? You know, uh, the electric ones now, which is you know about twice as much as, what, yeah. are, what are we talking? Uh, so the ones we just bought um, were, I want to, I, I think they were right around 30 grand with the various accessories and uh, wheels and things like that that we had to, to get for them. Mm -hmm. and, and I also wanted to ask you, tell me how the, battery charging unit that is mobile how does that how does that work i know they have one that is wired into a truck um, that they can use for some mobile charging that's obviously not the most sustainable thing in and of itself um, more typical is they'll just have a charger and they'll take it with them where they can move it to a one of our maintenance sheds in a different place and have one gotcha. close so, by so it's charging so it's not, close by i'm with you not on them necessarily yeah not on the truck right yeah because that's generally not feasible right okay yeah yeah thank you mm -hmm. i appreciate it those are being on spec so you have questions Mr. Street. yeah i um i guess my one of the concerns with gas powered equipment is for the health of the people who use the equipment especially mm -hmm. if it's a backpack or something um that's very close to their face uh, have you used them long enough to, to notice a difference in, um, <clears throat> in a reduction maybe in um, uh, illnesses or workplace, um, what's it called, workers' comp right. claims, things like that? Or um, You know, I can't say that I've noticed any 
you know, market difference in statistically of, of things like that that we could associate with that. We'd have to ask staff how do they feel about using them. I know we've had a lot of staff uh, be very skeptical about it at first and, and kind of come around, okay, this, this can work for our, for our cause. But again, it, it does cost more. Um, I do think staff have appreciated that they are quieter in general. I do think there's a misconception, you know, when we got the, uh, the green mowers for switch yard, someone was like, oh, they're going to be out there silent. And well, no, they're still going to make a lot of noise when they're mowing. Um, but, you know, when they're, when the blades aren't spinning, that's when they'll be quiet. So I think in terms of ear, ear protection <coughs> and hearing protection, our staff should be wearing that anyway, but certainly less impactful with the noise of operating that up close. Uh, Mr. Street, we, we're looking at this sort of in the context of other municipalities or even states that have passed legislation. Um, have you been looking at those as models? Uh, peripherally aware. Okay. I wouldn't say we've been looking at those as models. We've kind of taken the approach of let's, let's get a chunk each year, and mm -hmm. rather than replacing our gas equipment as it ages out, let's not buy new gas equipment, let's, let's phase it out. Because that gas equipment, you know, we don't want to just throw it in the trash either. Um, we want to sustain it and use it as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking in terms of performance of the equipment and, you know, Oh, in terms what, of benchmarking? You know. Yes. Um, no, I can't say that we have. Okay. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, Councilman Marshall. I might just to follow up on the, when you mentioned uh, for the, the mowers in particular, kind of mm -hmm. a five or six year t timeline before, uh, am I gathering that over, over that time period, if the mower is effective and, and lasts and is still serviceable in five years, that's when it becomes essentially an equivalent life cycle cost, esti estimated. I know you haven't tested that. Yes, I, I have a chart, and I didn't refresh myself on it, um, that was you know, kind of projected kilowatt hours mm -hmm. um, over the years of how much it would take to charge it versus gas versus how many hours we would use it, things like that. Um, uh, also versus it's sort of the, the value that would retain theoretically, which is information we got from the mm -hmm. manufacturer. So again, we have to test that. Uh, but I'm sure I could find where I have that if that's something you would like to see. Uh, yeah, I think it would, yeah, that would be helpful actually. And so for the mower, you mentioned something close to like 100% price pre premium, so close to double mm -hmm. uh, on the upfront cost for that particular piece of equipment. What yeah. do you have an estimate, you know, ballpark on uh, more like the handheld equipment, like string trimmers and, and handheld blowers or backpack blowers? Um, I, again, I think it varies a little bit based on brand, mm -hmm. and, and some of the folks here tonight could probably speak to this better than I could, but um, I'm going to give you a complete ballpark number of 150% mm -hmm. on some of the things that we're getting. So 50% um, more than, it's, uh, than yeah. gas equipment. Okay. Um, but again, if you're getting uh, a, a good brand, mm -hmm. um, I think that could be that could be more okay. as well. It just depends what you're comparing against. Okay. That Thank is you. not a scientific number. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm just looking for uh, a general understanding. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Okay, further questions from the committee for the Mr. Street? Okay. M maybe. Oh, no? <laughs> uh, so, just confirming. Uh, so, there's not a, a planned final phase out timeline for any of the equipment categories for parks. You're sort of taking it as, as it comes and. That's yeah, something we could right. develop or look at developing, but you yeah, don't have that in place yet. Is yeah, that right? Exactly. Okay. No, no official phase out plan. Our, our approach thus far has been as equipment ages mm -hmm. out to first and foremost try to replace it with electric if we feel like the technology yep. and the budget is there to replace it with electric. And um, what um, among the different types of equipment you use, what would you say is the longest <laughs> typical life cycle? Like what's the turnover of, of these different types of equipment? You know, three to five years, five to ten? Does it depend a lot? It on depends the type. a lot, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Um, so replacing... You know, we have a lot of steel blowers and string trimmers and things like that, and those are great products, mm -hmm. and they tend to last a long time if they're well cared for. But they do need more maintenance and care on the on the gas engines on them over those years as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, sorry. I, forget oh. To, I forget to raise my hand. <laughs> well, just a quick follow-up. So, uh, who does the repairs on your equipment? Is it fleet or is it done in-house at parks? Oh, uh, in-house. Okay. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. I, I can't remember. Uh, this isn't necessarily to you. I, I don't remember if we ever established what is the um, uh, of you know lawn care equipment. Which one really is the most offensive in producing uh, you know the most. Uh, extra carbon or pollution or you know is it 
going to be mowers? Is it going to be blowers? Because uh, I'm looking at the inventory, and that's a really, really helpful thing. And it looks like there's lots of, uh, you know, blowers and, yeah. that are used. And, and, of course, if it's one big mower, that's different than 15 diff little mowers, right? So did we ever figure that out as far as, you know, uh, as a committee or Mr. Street, if you have any thoughts, you can just, yeah. I'm not sure. I wouldn't venture. Yeah. I was, I was looking at the two-stroke engines in general and the amount of emissions in the Edmonds report, you know, describes it and goes through a study and comparatively running a half an hour of a two-stroke engine is com is comp comparable to running a, a, I think a pickup truck thousands of miles in terms of emissions. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, there, there's a lot of... Um, just just a point of clarification, a particular local air pollution emissions that are thousands of times greater than a pickup truck yeah. because they don't have, you know, uh, things to clean the, the, the tail, like, like a truck does to clean the tailpipe emissions. So it's not, it's not greenhouse gas emissions, not carbon emissions, mm -hmm. uh, carbon dioxide emissions that are that much higher. It's just that they Yes. Right. Oh, they're so not, not greenhouse gas emissions. Still important, local air pollution, arguably more important <laughs> for health and safety, uh, you know, in the local context. I just want to clarify that, like, that's, yeah. it's not the, it's the air pollution more than the, the climate issue with respect to the emissions. That's right. Non-methane, hydrocarbons, nitrogen oxides. So by volume, is it then, again, I'm, I'm perseverating on this issue, is it like, you know, is there lots of two-stroke engines used with mowers and blowers that really is, you know, it, it's more than like lawn mowers. It's, it, you know, it's handheld blowers. You know what I mean? I'm trying to figure out what equipment really is the biggest offender and trying to think of a way to prioritize that in my mind. Gas powered lawn and garden equipment. The, the, the survey asked about gas powered equipment, including leaf blowers, screen trimmers, lawn mowers, chainsaws, et cetera. Right. Could you like to? Oh. <laughs> and, and, and I will say that question wasn't uh, intended to get at what's, what what are the worst offenders. I, I think is your question. Uh, what what equipment is the worst? You know, as far as polluting. Um, well, two strokes. I get that, but it looks like there's 14 chainsaws, at least from the public works inventory, and 12 weed eaters. In uh, the rest of them are you know, like a little bit uh, different. But those are the seem like the frequency. So I mean, I'm just I'm just trying to help my brain think about yep. if we can't do all two strokes at the same time, what? How can we figure out ways to start? quantify them? Yeah, and, yeah, and, and prioritize and the relative them. effects. Yeah, and uh, the, the uh, feasibility of replacement and so forth. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I don't think we're there yet, but I think that's a very good question. Uh, could. Can you speak to that at all, Mr. Street, um, uh, with respect to what equipment is what engine type, and is that uniform, or is it vary based on the age of the equipment and the, how it's used? I mean, my, my understanding is that a lot of the like blowers are two-stroke engines, but mowers are more of like the four-stroke. But I don't—I just like read that somewhere. I don't <laughs> deal with this equipment regularly. I—I so I might be in the same situation as you, or I, I don't have the mechanical expertise to elaborate much more on that. But what you're saying sounds like my understanding as well. A little bit good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Other questions for Mr. Street? Thanks, Mr. Street. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have further discussion, sure. but okay, let's go to the Thank stakeholder you. survey. And we had uh, six respondents, including Mr. Street, and uh, our staff uh, uh, sought input from various uh, businesses that could be impacted um, by any legislation uh, and asked them to fill out a st stakeholder questionnaire. Uh, we have the results of it here, and then invited them to this meeting. And so uh, per perhaps we, we should just go through the survey, um, since this is being televised. And I can go through this briefly, um, because there aren't the, that many questions. And I think that a lot of the responses are, are similar, um, or iterations of, of them, uh, reiterations. So the question first was, does your business use electric equipment when available? Um, two respondents, uh, three respondents were no, one was some, and then two were yes. Is your, if your business does not use electric equipment, 
what are the primary reasons for using gas powered or two stroke oil gas mixture equipment instead? Uh, price point, efficiency, consistency, and overall more reliable, ease of maintenance and, and initial cost. Electrical equipment has not come far enough. It doesn't work as well and doesn't run for nearly as long. The quality of the equipment is not all the way there. To keep up with the usage during the day, it is going to take time for it to catch up. Um, for certain heavy duty uses, gas equipment is still necessary. Uh, doesn't hold charge long enough, can't uh, recharge mobily. Uh, the third question is what would it require for you to switch to some or all of your equipment to electric? Improvements in weather conditions, reduced cost, better technology, run times, another better technology. Uh, this stuff is relatively new on the commercial side to hold up to the amount of time it would be used. The addition, additional cost to, to implement all of it with charging station, how to charge it on the job and, and service providers. Funding would take care of replacing most equipment. For a few items, we would need the technology to advance a bit more as it relates to power and battery life, and then better <coughs> technology and mobile charging is an answer. Uh, question four is, which pieces of equipment would be the most challenging to switch to electric? Heavy equipment, fertilizer application machines, none exist, and lawnmowers. Um, price. Lawnmowers, leaf blowers, string trimmers, chainsaws, leaf vacuums. Mowers and blowers, chainsaws, heavier duty lawnmowers, bush hogs. We have had good success with blowers and trimmers large mowers uh, equipment. Uh, the next question is, what is the re realistic timeline considering your normal replacement schedule for converting some or all of your gas powered equipment to electric? No timeline until significant improvements are made. Uh, another response is five to 10 years. Another response is not until the technology improved, years. Um, Another response is look at cell phone 10 years ago compared to today and how we use and all the features that will take 10 years to catch up, I say 10 years. Uh, another response at two to four years, the most equipment would be replaced with appropriate funding very quickly and I imagine technology will advance on some of the heavier duty items in the coming years. And the last response was three to five years. And then the last question is, is there anything else on the topic that you'd like to share with council members? First response is, please bring back common sense and focus our efforts and tax dollars on more productive issues. Second response was, electric powered equipment is a great idea. As of now, the initial investment is prohibitive unless these costs are passed on to the consumer. Most clients would see somewhere in the 30 to 50% range of price increases. Uh, Respondent three is, it is unrealistic at this point to expect businesses to be able to do the same work in the same amount of time by using subpar electric equipment cost to customers would skyrocket. Uh, respondent four is no. no uh, respondent five was I'm happy to answer more questions if needed. And uh, respondent six was doing this will be much easier for larger companies, but smaller companies and mom and pops will be put out of business. So those are the responses. Um, is there any discussion from the committee before we go to stakeholders? Because I'd like to allow plenty of time for them to to give further responses. Yes, uh, just, just informally, um, some additional data to add, which is that uh, I've been in touch a few times with Jessica Davis, who's the head of sustainability for the entire Indiana University system, um, all seven or nine campuses, wherever it is. Uh, and I, she's been located at IUPUI for about 10 years <coughs> and also serves as the ex CSC for um, sustainability at IU on the Commission on Sustainability. And in particular at IEPUI over the last, over recent years, they've been making a concerted effort to electrify their equipment. And I just asked her um, roughly, uh, you know, percentage-wise how much progress they made. She said for handheld equipment, about 80% is now electric. Riding mowers, two of the five, uh, walk behind mowers, none yet. And so that's roughly where they are, which is maybe worth noting in the context of another like institutional um, actor that, that uh, in particular is called out in our climate action plan as well to potentially um, uh, partner or uh, have, have joint commitments with, with the city. So I felt that was a little bit relevant to the discussion we just had. And just uh, on that topic as well, I think they're gonna, they're looking to do some demonstrations and um, 
uh, other other work uh, with uh, electric equipment riders in the near future uh, here at the Bloomington campus, and that might be an opportunity for us to collaborate on that as well. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to highlight that for the committee. Uh, I also wanted to point out, it didn't make it into the packet, which we uh, sent out at the end of last week. Uh, just yesterday, the Indiana Outdoor Management Alliance contacted the council office. Uh, we do have hard copies of that uh, letter here in, in the room for folks. Um, that is a, a group that uh, apparently represents uh, a couple of landscape trade associations here in the state. Uh, they went ahead and answered the questions that uh, Councilmember Rollo just read off uh, and also included a letter uh, expressing some of the similar concerns voiced in, in that survey. So uh, committee members have access to that. It's here in the room and we'll, we'll include that in, in these materials uh, in the future. So. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I guess uh, reviewing the um, responses to our survey, um, I kind of wish we had made a bigger distinction between um, like the bigger equipment and the smaller equipment. I mean, the two-stroke engines in, in particular are usually for the small equipment, and that's kind of what we've been focusing on in our discussions uh, up to this point. Um, and uh, so that's what I, I would love to hear from anybody giving public comment tonight, if they could kind of separate out, okay, would it be feasible perhaps for two-stroke engines, perhaps not as feasible for four-stroke or other heavy equipment, um, if people could kind of give, uh, give their input um, on those varying types of equipment, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, that's a good idea. Any, any other direction that we could provide the stakeholders before they comment so that we can you know, anticipate questions? I have one, and that is, well, Pete Smith says, has said it well in terms of prioritization of the type of equipment. I'd also like to know what kind of incentives would you know facilitate such uh, a move uh, because I understand you know this could be an economic hardship and and that's something I'd like to mitigate or obviate if possible uh, and I appreciate your time coming to this evening why don't, why don't you just come up and take a seat near the microphones if you'd like to um, add further comments uh, why don't we since we have relatively few people I think we can allow five minutes per speaker uh, Steve, Mr. Lucas, could you could you put a timer on just so we have an idea of the uh, the timing, and then we could open it up to questions after you make the statement and uh, get get to know specifically your concerns. So, um, so um, by show of hands, who would like to? Speak. I guess everyone who, who pulled up a chair would like to speak. So, and, so and, and I'll just just for timing. Uh, I know we've got a couple of folks on Zoom. I've got uh, one or two messages that uh, folks would like to speak uh, from home as well. So, okay. it's time we'll we'll call on those folks. I think we can allow five minutes. Is that all right with everyone? Because this is very important. Yeah. So, uh, sir, would you like to begin? Hello, my name is Greg Peters. I own Soaring Eagle Horticulture Service, and um, I am. I would like to see us switch to electric. I just don't think that the time is now. Um, I run gas power, chainsaws, weed eaters, blowers, and um, it was mentioned that they produce air pollution. They do. When I come home at the end of the day, I smell like exhaust because we are using engines that mix in oil into the gas. Um, for that reason, I did buy electric blowers. I have found that they work the same as the gas-powered. Um, over at JNS Locksmith, I, I wanted to switch over. I talked to the manager there. He's like, they're indestructible. Your guys can't tear them up. The guys do damage the gas-powered ones because they don't mix the oil right or something. So there was an incentive for me to switch to electric. Now, running the machines, I have found that you'll get about 45 minutes out of it. That's it. And I carry, you know, an extra battery. But when you're doing apartment complexes and things like that, unlike an institution like the campus, you don't have anywhere to plug it in. You're not going to find a place to charge it. If you're doing residential properties, you're not there long enough to charge something. And if you're going to try to charge it off your truck, well, then the truck is running. So... I think that long term, I would think that everybody in this industry wants to switch to 
battery power, you know, battery uh, powered machinery. The bigger machines, I called JNS Locksmith today. I said, "What is the biggest bar, the length of the bar that a chainsaw, an electric chainsaw, can use?" He said, "20 inches." Well, a 20 inch will only cut a 40 inch log. So now, now what are you going to do? Get a, a two man buck saw like we used to use? <laughs> um, so yeah, for for lighter equipment, I think electric will probably happen in the next five years if people want to switch over and we have to figure out a way of charging them that's our biggest problem and as far as the cost the smaller stuff is not that much more expensive but the bigger equipment was 30,000 for a mower a mower right now that the guys stand on runs about 15,000 so now you're talking 30,000 I don't see how it can happen um, I mean, that's just my thoughts on it. It's, the techni technology is coming, it's just not there yet. So. Thank you. Yep, uh, Lester Andrews, Nature's Link Incorporated. Uh, I'll reiterate pretty much everything that Greg said. And then uh, as far as cost, yes, uh, I looked into a little bit of that, just broad brush stroke, trying to see about what we would be looking at. Running three mowing crews, typically you're you're looking at uh, two. We use stand on platform, 52 inch and a 60 inch. Uh, so we usually have two mowers on the truck plus a 36 inch for the smaller areas, and then a push mower for the real small areas, and then string trimmers and blowers, of course. Uh, by the time you equip that truck, you're roughly $100,000 per truck. So. The mowers alone, we're going to be right around 275,000. Plus, you'd have the uh, plus you have the cost of all the smaller equipment, and then that didn't charge the, or didn't include the chargers to actually charge up the equipment, the ones to plug into a wall. You could either do a 110 or a 220. So if you do 220, then all of a sudden you got to, have to get the electricians to come to your site and then rewire your site to be able to handle that, which be so yes, it would be a rather large upfront cost. Uh, if you had 300,000 to equip three crews, uh, that's a, that would be a big fee to pass on to your clients. Uh, so as of right now, I don't see that being feasible on running a fully electric crew. Uh, and then the other problem you run into is the battery life on the jobs. There's a big difference between residential mowing and, and commercial mowing and commercial leaf removal as opposed to commercial uh, residential leaf removal. Uh, he mentioned that the blowers, they only run for 30, 45 minutes. If you're on a big commercial property, those things can run for six hours. So unless you had a number of batteries that you can send out to them or a way to charge them off the, the, the truck in some fashion, then I don't really see the feasibility of really even running the blowers. That's one of the problems. Uh, so that's part of that on the on the mowing side. The next one I'd like to point out is in your strategy, TL 1.1. Uh, you also mentioned diesel power construction equipment and then off-road equipment like construction equipment. So I'd like to kind of draw attention to that verbiage from what this reads. It looks as though you're you're also considering larger like skid steers and that sort of things. Um, so if something like this would pass, I would urge someone to kind of take a look at that verbiage and kind of make it a little bit more specific if it's gonna be actually lawn equipment or if you're looking at actual construction equipment because there's a, there's a really large differential in that one. So I think that's about all I have at this time. Thank you very much. Sure. Sir. Hello, um, my name is Lucas Murphy. I'm the owner of Murphy Hardscaping Construction. Um, we do very minimal maintenance and lawn care. Uh, we do construction and large structural retaining walls, um, patios, things like that. Um, last year, we, we built a six foot tall, 180 foot long retaining wall that was reinforcing a retaining wall that was reinforcing soil underneath the foundation for a home that was literally falling off the side of a hill. Um, we moved 100 pounds or 1 million pounds of stone in front of the failing retaining wall. 
and uh, we moved about 800 large Diamond Pro retaining wall block. Um, I went to the GIE Expo last year. Um, I did see the electric equipment that they have. <clears throat> There'd be no way that I could have completed that job and saved that house. Um, that, that's something that I'm really proud of that we did. Um, but right now they do not have equipment that could run. I mean, we were hauling stone uh, eight to 10 hours a day um, continuously for two weeks. <coughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I would share the sentiments that there is, there is a major difference um, between those two things. I would also point out I'm a very small co company. Um, I subcontract out my excavation when I can uh, to a, a partner that's also a diesel mechanic. Um, when I don't do that, I, I'll, I rent my equipment. So I'd say the discussion here needs to be expanded. The stakeholders also include rental companies um, that rent out these, this equipment. I would also say the equipment that I use <coughs> is also pertains to people that do concrete work. Um, mud buggies, we use a lot of mud buggies. <coughs> we also use, um, uh, for concrete work, they do make, I, I did see just recently uh, plate compactors that are battery powered. With plate compaction, you know, I, the, the battery powered plate compactors that I've seen, you'd have to compact in such small lifts that it would make installing uh, concrete extremely expensive. Um, installing driveways. And yes, things driveways, so things like that, yeah. yeah. Also, labor for doing concrete finishing is al it, it's almost it's it's very hard to find anyone to do it. So we rely on things like uh, screed screed demons and, and power screeds for concrete. Um, so that would also be considered, I guess, a construction equipment that would need to be looked into because without that, you'd have to have multiple people. So I think expanding this to people that do concrete work, construction companies things like that, I think, because this would, this would also affect their work as it affects our work. <coughs> also, uh, we do some minimal leaf removal. I do have some leaf removal accounts. Um, you know, we have one, one account in particular. Uh, it, we use backpack blowers. It takes uh, two to three of us, um, about six to eight hours of continuous use of those backpack blowers just to remove <coughs> all the leaves from that one property. Um, I have used battery-powered leaf blowers. Um, they just don't have nearly the force or the longevity of battery life to move heavy leaves, especially when they're wet or partially frozen to the ground. Um, I also use backpack blowers to uh, remove aggregate um, from driveways and different areas like that. I literally blow stone and, and lime dust <coughs> to uh, clear areas and, uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, so, yeah, uh, so yeah, I, I think the conversation needs to ex expand and also um, th for who the stakeholders are and also I share the sentiments of the speakers that spoke before me. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes, <coughs> um, I'm Glenn with g and Long Care. Uh, I think the guys in front of us have uh, definitely brought light to some of the issues already. Obviously, I'm, my time, I guess, I want to spend on uh, lights that they haven't thought of. Uh, as our employment gains and loses through our industry, it's definitely the toughest part, and we're relying on equipment to be able to be used. So with relying on equipment that definitely is not tested or shown longevity, it's not something that we're willing to invest in until that point. Uh, there, there was a point where somebody was at the GIE last year, uh, an electric mower actually caught on fire on the biggest stage that they have for the green industry. It took a long time for it to be actually put out because no one has the, the proper equipment to actually justify having that on the floor. Nobody knew that this was going to happen. So when those lithium ion batteries ignited, nobody had the equipment to, to put it out. So that's uh, something that, I mean, obviously the city, everything else, we're, we're having to upfitting our uh, vehicles with safety features that 
obviously we don't have to worry about right now. A fire extinguisher definitely do anything that we have handling. Um, Mr. Street had quoted $30,000 for a new mower. Well, that's definitely with a municipality discount. The guys that you see here aren't going to be getting those discounts at all. None of that applies to us. I have a quote from today, a uh, 60-inch uh, stand-on mower, $40,663 plus tax. A sit-down mower, $45,818 with a runtime of both mowers, seven hours of use. So when you take a, a normal two-guy crew that's out mowing all day, you know, that, that use obviously isn't seven hours every time, but to guarantee that your, your stuff is getting completed, you may have to upfit that, that same crew with three mowers because there's no charging station in between the time. And if those guys don't make it back in time to make sure everything's plugged in, it takes 12 hours for it to fully charge and, and to be ready for the next day. This uh, estimates, they have no idea what the up, up fitting is going to be or up cost is going to be uh, for damaging. Um, obviously, if we damage a spool or spindle in, in, the, in the field, you know, it, it's going to be readily available for us to be able to go to a local mower shop and take care of it. Uh, for you know three to four hundred dollars where you're talking it could be thousands whether our battery will sustain long enough for it to be efficient enough for us to continue to purchase that that's still yet to be shown so this is a, a major leap forward and I think it's going too far forward to make it realistic for everybody a lot of companies here can afford you know 40 or 50 or 80 hundred thousand dollars that's fine but it's not sustainable for everybody. And whenever you look at putting ordinances in, this is for everybody. This isn't just for us that can, can handle it. You gotta look at everybody. And I'd rather speak for the person that's not here and, and doesn't even know about this meeting because they're not big enough to even be on your radar. Those people do matter. I mean, it, it, they count. It, it's just not efficient at this point. I'm not saying that smaller stuff you know, if, if weed eaters and hand blowers are justifiable, that may be. But in certain settings, there's going to have to be limitations or restrictions or available uh, time restraints where we're not having to, to be able to use any equipment available. There's, there's got to be other options available uh, along with what we have. Okay. Yes, sir. Just another little couple little things to add to what he said and I totally agree with all that as well but the other two things seven hour runtime uh, my assumption is they're pretty much basing that on brand new batteries so we all know that as those batteries get older you're going to get less and less runtime out of them so you know if you get two years three years down the line that seven hour runtime may turn into five so having a way to be able to charge those while you're going along would, would have to come into play and or run a whole lot of extra batteries. Mm -hmm. And then has anybody really looked into uh, <laughs> recycling lithium batteries? Last I checked, I believe that's hazardous material if I'm not mistaken. So if we, if we make a huge push to lithium batteries, we might be just creating another problem. And then the other thing to consider, which also, I don't know if you guys have really thought about, is typically with when we run our mowers, we have a backup. Uh, there's always at least one extra mower sitting at the shop just in case there's a breakdown or there's a mechanical issue. As of, as of right now, as far as I know, there's really nobody locally who's servicing this equipment yet because it's all brand new. Uh, so if one of those breaks down, uh, unless you happen to have another 50 grand or 40 grand to pop for another mower that sits at your shop, uh, you're pretty much going to have to dedicate and, and rely on gas-powered equipment as a backup mm -hmm. uh, possibility. So there, there would have to be some infrastructure in town as far as resources to be able to get things repaired as well. So. Uh, just to... Just to uh uh, follow up on the idea of any legislation. There's no legislation pending, and this is really we're exploring the topic um, in terms of its feasibility since the since the report directed us to consider it, and then we're going to report back to the to the Common Council as a body 
in terms of recommend, recommending what, what can be done, if anything. But the, the, so right now, we're just really trying to explore the topic. And this has been really helpful to understand uh, you know, the feasibility of it. So um, is there anything else anyone would like to add before we continue? And what, you know, you'll, you'll have other uh, chance for discussing this, and we'll probably have some questions. But is there anything else that you, you'd like to say? Power washer. Um, I don't know if any commercial power washers that are electric. I mean, they make small homeowner units, but anything four gallons a minute or higher, um, I'm not aware of anything that's electric that's able to do that. Um, power washing is is um, power. The primary thing that we're getting rid of when we're power washing is glue caps of magma. It actually eats uh, calcium carbonate, which is cement. Um, it does quite a bit of damage um, to concrete products, asphalt shingles, um, and it's extremely aggressive. Um, so I, it's not something that's just for beautification. It does save an extremely amount of a, a large amount of money for the community. Um, so I would say that would need to be explored as to you know actually how much emissions are coming from power washers. Um, versus how much damage is being done by bacteria and algae in the community. Good point. Yeah. yeah. One other, just a brief one. Um, the other technology that's out there that does cut uh, emissions quite a lot is propane. It's pretty easy to convert the bigger mowers and such over to propane. And still, so if the goal is to reduce emissions, I think that should probably be something that should be explored. Because that's a very inexpensive thing to do, and especially for the smaller guys who've already got existing but uh, mowers and such on, on on hand. I think it only costs five or six hundred bucks to convert them over. So that's for four the four stroke engines to to use as an alternate yeah. bigger equipment. I don't think okay. they run anything. I don't think they have anything for small ones. No, yeah. just mowers. Yeah, but for the bigger equipment. Okay. Okay, terrific. Uh, this has been really informative, but, uh, but let's check Zoom right now to see are there, and, and let's just focus right now on business and industry and their, and their comments. Is there anyone on Zoom that has any? Uh, we have. I, I'm not sure if we've got any folks, uh, uh, business folks here. Uh, we do have a Wayne Caldwell Emmy uh, with a hand raised, um, and I do have comments. I'll, I'll read briefly if that's all right. Michael Hall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know if we want to take general comment now. I, I'd like to go to public after we okay. address the business concerns, just to keep them kind of separate. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, does, is Mr. Hall associated with business, or does he have a general comment? I think these are general public. Okay. Comments. Let's 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 hold off on that. Um, so, what would the ch committee like to do? Would you like to go to questions for the businesses, and then we'll go to public comments? Yes. Okay. Um, so, questions for uh, the businesses uh, concerned that are present. Any? Sure. Matt, yeah, would you like thank to you begin? very much uh, for sharing uh, survey responses and information here. I think I'll agree with Councilman Morallo that you know the Climate Action Plan is a 2050 vision uh, that sets strategies over the next 10 years that we should consider. Uh, in particular, the possibility of an ordinance, a phase-out ordinance, is a later phase uh, piece of. of um, potential actions, uh, starting more so with incentives, uh, city operations, that sort of thing, which is, you know, as you heard, we're taking steps on. Um, and also fully agree that the technology has to be there. We can't <laughs> legislate something, obviously, that isn't uh, technologically feasible or uh, would be um, unduly burdensome from a, from a cost perspective. So I think, like Councilman Morales said, I just wanted to agree that, that we're learning more, gathering information, you know, looking at options. Uh, and I kind of wanted to confirm or, or invite more more follow-up on my what I took to be my um, took away from some of your comments uh, specifically with respect to smaller equipment possibly string trimmers and and blowers um, I guess first for, for my own education are those types of equipment generally two-stroke engines uh, both types feel free to <laughs> yeah just comment yeah. Or, yeah. or not yeah. um, and it sounds <laughs> like it's not a major um, that the biggest concern there is not so much uh, replacement or operating costs, life cycle costs, especially with enough lead time. The biggest concern is 
um, the ability to charge for extended periods of use, and possibly uh, below that, uh, the power available. Is, is that fairly representative of, of your all's views, or yeah, feedback on and that? Run times, yes. So yeah. run times, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and charging. I mean, if you're moving around every mm -hmm. 20, 30 minutes, you don't have a place to plug it in, how are you going to charge it? I mean, that's a major issue. And I can tell you apartment complexes, there's nowhere to plug in. Now, in the future, if something's set up, that would be great. Um, you know, how many batteries you carry is up to you. They're expensive, but um, that would, that's, I think that's the major problem, is runtime on the batteries and where do you charge them for the small equipment? And uh, uh, so you mentioned, I believe, uh, Mr. Peters, that um, uh, you tried some some electric uh, blowers, is that right? Yeah. And uh, uh, in terms of the cost, like, would you typically have one extra battery for an application? Have you considered more than that? Is that where it starts to become cost prohibitive well, if you have two or three? They charge pretty fast. Mm -hmm. you charge, plug them into the wall, mm -hmm. maybe 15 minutes or something like that. Okay. Um, the the runtime, just flat out running it, was about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have another one somewhere, another battery to put in, great. You know, how many batteries are you going to carry, though, mm -hmm. if you can only run it for 30 minutes throughout the day, and you're going to do an eight-hour day. So, so leave season, you need <laughs> 10. Leave, mm -hmm. leave season, you never, it never stops. Right. It's just nonstop. Never stop. turn off at leave season. Right. Yeah. yeah. If you're just blowing sidewalks, you know, it's pretty quick. But, yeah. Um, yeah, and then if you had three guys, that would be 30 batteries. Yeah. I think that's it for now. Thank you. Some of the Thank you. Committee members have questions for affected businesses. Uh, I was so you just said that it just made me think. How much are batteries? Four to five hundred dollars yeah. for the top grade. That's so you, per battery. So you'd need well, thirty of those during leave season if you had the three-man crew. You to be able to, can you charge them on your trailers? Like As of inverter, right now, with no. an inverter of hundred, that'd be with a, a truck. But inverter. I mean, then why have that if you're going to run a truck? Because a truck, the the equivalent is thirty minutes of a gas blower is equivalent in hydrocarbon emissions to driving a truck from Texas to Alaska. So you could run a truck for two thousand miles and equal thirty minutes of gas you know, so for, for the, the for next it. thing I would say on that is if I have to if I have to sit there with my truck idling one is that going to be secure is somebody going to steal it two uh, engine hours on the lifetime of the truck am I going to deplete the life of my truck which is now 75 grand so you could you could get an inverter I'm sure but I, I think the truck has to be running in order for that inverter Correct. To run. Yeah. yeah so you could but the truck's got to run Okay. Uh, Councilmember Smith, did you? Oh, are you thank satisfied? You. Thank you. Yeah, that was just. Okay. I thought well, that was important. Also, to I would say, in terms of safety, inverters do, unless they're properly stored, they do emit sparks that can. You know, I, I do run an inverter um, to charge some batteries, but it, it they do emit sparks, so there would have to be some kind of safety container, or it'd have to be rigged up outside of the vehicle. Because um, they do emit sparks that could cause vehicle fires. Okay. <coughs> Councilmember Piedmont Smith, do you have questions? Yeah, so I guess um, uh, given that um, there are workable alternatives that are electric for the smaller equipment, the trimmers and the mowers and the, the handheld blowers, um, there are, I, I hear your concerns about charging them. Um, would, what, so if we did enact some kind of restrictions, um, what would you imagine to be a reasonable time period? I mean, you know, we don't expect you to replace your whole, you know, fleet of, of that small equipment at once. Um, I don't you know what they're... You keep saying small equipment, but... Everybody has a different idea, so I think you need to specify small equipment. Mowers are not a small equipment. No, I'm not yeah. including mowers. You I'm said mowers. You, I you said, said blowers. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry, sorry. I meant, um, and I and I'm a total layperson, so yeah. I don't know quarter of what you guys know. Um, 
But I was thinking of the mowers, the string trimmers, and the, the backpack like leaf blowers. Is that? You said mowers. You said mowers again. Right. So you're. Is it handheld equipment versus blowers? Right? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I meant I, blowers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My apologies. Um, so not mowers, string trimmers and blowers. <coughs> um, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is what, uh, what kind of a phase in would you all need if this is, and I'm, if, it's a big if, if the city were to try to um, move in a direction that is more environmentally friendly with those. I, I mean, I'll just step in. I, I think as long as your verbiage is correct in, <laughs> in, in what you're saying, smaller equipment it shouldn't be an issue within the next five years. Mm, yeah. But yeah. whenever you, you uh, so you specifically, I'm sorry to, to point you out, but your, your idea of an equipment is a lot different than each one of these guys sitting here. My idea of a small piece of equipment is... Uh, a ditch witch, you know, a, a, a utilized machine. Um, so you you have to be correct and directive with any verbiage that you decide that you want to do. And it's a lot easier to know specifically, hey, this is what we consider small equipment. This is what we consider mid, mid range equipment, large equipment, and, and so on. That, that's what it's going to take. It, having a defined definition instead of just a broad view, is it's not gonna help anybody. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I, I agree, five years, if you, if we're talking ma basically handheld yeah. equipment. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I would say five years, with the exception of like leaf removal season, uh, I would say yeah. that there would be need to be certain dates, but then you'd have, you know, to have multiple sets of equipment you know, for those different things, because I, I don't know, unless they develop within the next five years uh, blowers, battery-powered blowers that are able to handle intense amount of leaves. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have any cost, I mean, you can buy a backpack battery now. I, I think it's like $1,500, but you're talking that's per person for limited run time. Yeah, how many batteries so, would you need? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, defined. <coughs> Because there's not enough data. Mm -hmm. Right. Are you interested mainly in machinery, machinery where you mix the oil into the gas, the, the dirtier ones, you might say? Yeah. The I ones that so. make me, I smell of exhaust yes. at the end of the day? Yeah. Yes, those in particular. I mean, that does help out these guys because they're just running machinery that just runs gas. Yeah. Um, maybe if you were to focus more on the ones where the oil is mixed into the gas, the, yes. maybe that would clarify things a bit more than a ditch witch versus a blower. Mm -hmm. The only problem they run into that is technically chainsaw would be handheld equipment. Well, and, and, and we don't have bigger, not big enough yet. ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the technology is not there yet. My guys love the electric powered, what we call climbing saw, hangs on their belt. Because if you've ever been in a tree on a rope on a cold day, you're cranking to get a gas one. They love the fact they squeeze the trigger, it's on. So I'm not saying that we're against this equipment, but it has to work. That's all we're asking. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of the uh, attention from the public uh, concern is with uh, leaf blowers. And so is it your estimation that we're talking uh, five years it would be feasible? Uh, yeah. Or, or is it, would it be a sooner time period? And, and suppose we were to provide incentives for that. Suppose the city were to provide incentives in terms of, uh, you know, replacement of, you know, so that, you, you know, you're not suffering the cost or it's discounted in some way, you know, yet to be determined. To improve the, the work and the labor. Our labor is, is dwindling now. So, I mean, if you take in one guy that has a, a large backpack blower, well, he can really move a lot of, a lot of debris whenever you're taking that same one guy trying to do the same work with the electric right now. I mean, you're a third of the time. Is that the consensus? You all agree with that? Or? Yeah, I don't okay. think the power's there yet. 
Okay. The power is not there to stop it, charge it. Yeah. Yeah. So the longevity of the power, the, the battery. I mean, currently, the cost of leaf removal. I mean, that's typically one of the biggest complaints we get is how much it costs because it just takes yeah. time. So if it takes a lot of time right now, we're already getting kickback as far as it's too expensive. If it takes two thirds Three longer, times. then yeah. our people would be willing to pay for that. Yeah. So, I mean, that that would be a pretty big concern. So when, when, I, when I look at this and look at the relative impact of CO2 emissions uh, of the equipment we're talking about, it's, it, it, it's lower moderate, but the emissions of hydrocarbons, other hydrocarbons, are, are, are much more significant. So there's a health concern for the public, especially for the oil gas mix. And then there was another topic that hasn't been brought up yet, and that is the, the sound. So... You know, um, if especially in the fall, if the leaf blowers are running continually, uh, and ev people hear them constantly going, and the sound is, you know, the the impact is is both um, the the loudness in terms of decibels, and it's also the frequency of the sound because certain frequencies carry further or are more annoying to people and so forth. So that's could you reflect on that for for a minute, in terms of Say, say, if the city were to choose regulating the time that these this equipment is used, say, if the, if you just had a no no equipment used on Sundays, would that affect your business? Or uh, if it were to be limited in terms of time of day, would that be problematic for you? Or uh, or even seasonally, if running, I suppose you're running leaf blowers around the 300 you know, all, all, all during the year. But could you just reflect on the timing, you know, in terms of legislation to say that certain days are, we're not going to be running leaf blowers, for instance. Is, it, is that problematic for you or is that agreeable? The only thing I bring up is what about emergency cleanup whenever you have a tree through a house? What are you going to do then? Say, well, we're going to have to clean it up tomorrow because we can't. Then you have to look at the customer and say, "Well, I'm I'm just sorry, we just can't do it." Would that be problematic for a leaf blower, though? Correct. Uh, I mean, you have to clean the debris up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I would say that you know, if I'm, if it might affect how I schedule my jobs because I I might be using a leaf blower to clear an area so that I can see it to do layout or excavation or something like that. So I mean, I, I, it would just add an additional layer of complication to that process. I mean, we work eight to six, for example, so I'm trying to figure out when would I run that blower so I wouldn't bother people. I'm conscious of the fact that when I go to a residential, I don't really want to make noise mm -hmm. early in the morning. Um, but where, where in that time frame am I going to just run the blowers in the afternoon after lunch, between 12 and 6? I, I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. we pretty much use them all the time and um, I'm old enough to remember when there weren't blowers and we had to use brooms and things to sweep driveways and I, when the first blower came out I was just like oh my goodness I mean talk about efficiency it just blew us away the the electric blower that I use is loud it's, I have to wear earplugs so I don't know if that's going to make that much difference using electric ones they're still loud and they're for some people, they irritate them, the noise, that constant noise. I, I get that. I just don't know how we can do our job without having them. Well, so. with, with the exception of, of an act of God or something like some, you know, tree falls in a house or something that needs to be cleaned up, you know, no, no a prohibition on Sundays. Is, is, is that problematic for any of you? No, yeah, I mean, we, we all run businesses. No, right? we, we don't okay. have our family time just as much yeah. as the next person. It's pretty sacred in yeah. our business. We don't want to work on worry Sunday. We're about somebody that's not a legitimate business, not us. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm just trying to yeah. kind of map out, you know, maybe how to maybe if there were, were restraint constraints in it, where to place them. But the, I don't want to, you know, extend the discussion too much longer because yeah. we need to hear from the public. So, is there any other committee questions for? The affected businesses. Can we go to public comment now? I don't have any questions. I just, can I say that it's just so helpful for you guys to be here talking with us? Like, incredibly helpful. Yeah. So, so, thank you. We appreciate the notification. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's go to public comment. If, if uh, those in the room would like to step up to a mic, you'll have to uh, share a mic to.
be recorded on, on CATS. And, uh, and then we'll go to Zoom as well. Um, so let's start in, in house. Uh, please introduce yourself. And uh, you have Hugh five Kramer, minutes. I'm a homeowner. And um, I'm talking uh, only about uh, com uh, residential um, uh, leaf blowers. 11 months a year, my family is assaulted by the extreme noise and highly toxic exhaust fumes from gas-powered blowers. I don't call them leaf blowers because most of the year they're used to blow grass clippings and small debris from hardscapes. In fact, there was one going today at the house behind us for a couple hours. This year, another house behind us was using them full blast for a few hours on Thanksgiving Day. Two years ago, they went all day on New Year's Day. Many of our neighbors like to run them on Friday and Saturday evenings every weekend, even Sunday mornings. It's like a hobby, something relaxing for them and their kids to do. It's not relaxing for us. We've stopped using our yard or deck because we never know when they're going to start up and destroy any peace and quiet and fill our home and yard with toxic fumes. It cannot be escaped in or out of the house. Studies show that the sound from these things is clearly audible for a quarter mile. A quarter mile radius around our home includes a couple hundred homes at least, which means most of the year there's always one going. I took a video I sent to this committee of my decibel meter at 100 decibels from the house behind us, which is twice as loud as the 90 decibels that causes hearing damage. Decibels are logarithmic, so 70 decibels is twice as loud as 60, et cetera. Lawn companies and homeowners can do much better by using battery-powered blowers or raking. I asked a lawn company in our neighborhood what they would charge to rake our front lawn. He looked at me like I was nuts, and they said, I don't know, um, two to three guys, maybe two to three hours. So we got our 12-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old boy from across the street, and they did it in a little over an hour. Was it perfect? Were there still a few leaves on the grass? Yes. But that also means there are still beneficial insects and soil nutrients that would have been blown away by the 900 CFM, 250 mile per hour winds from these things. People blow all this beneficial stuff off their lawns and then have to douse them with toxic chemicals to get that perfect manufactured lawn. We're past that and we're better than that as a society and a community. These things are serious polluters that should obviously be regulated. This is no different than secondhand smoke and public smoking bans with the apt analogy, your right to swing your arms around stops at my face. Your right to have a manicured lawn stops at my family's mental and physical health. Paid operators suffer the most and are the least likely to be able to do anything about it. A study by the Air Resources Board found that operators of gas-powered devices, including leaf blowers, can double their risk of cancer. This is the result of exposure to volatile organic compounds. Among the carcinogenic, among the carcinogenic compounds emitted by leaf blowers are benzene, butadine, and formaldehyde, and that's not to mention the other hazards of the job including hearing loss and the inhalation of toxic particulate matter. Picture the dust clouds that are often accompanied by leaf blowing, knowing that these unfortunate workers are breathing this stuff up to eight hours a day. I'd be curious to see how many lawn companies pay their employees health insurance to cover the, cover the damage caused by these things. This is the definition of environmental injustice. Blowing blades of grass with a gas blower is like killing a fly with an AR-15 assault rifle. Lawn companies can put a $150 inverter on their trailers, as we discussed, have a few bat spare batteries charging all the time, and you can blow grass. There's just, <laughs> there's no argument about that. Little blades of grass off of the uh, hardscape. It's what they do in cities across the country that have regulated or banned these things, and there are well over a couple hundred. Cost of doing business, that's it. Or they can hire even more workers and rake as was done for 100 years before the unfortunate advent of the gas blower. It's a boon for employment. I think this committee is already aware of the severe health hazards to operators, the high, the high levels of air pollution and near field toxicity, and of course the dangerous and quality of life destroying noise levels. 
cities and towns in some states across the country have or are in the process of regulating and or banning these toxic and unnecessary machines. And I hope that our city of Bloomington can do the same. Our sibling city, Palo Alto, banned them in 1997 for the reasons above and many more. As you consider regulation, please keep this in mind. Lower costs or convenience do not justify any offensive polluting activity. If they did, we would have no pollution or noise controls of any kind. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Let's go to Zoom. Mr. Lucas? Yes, we have Elaine and Philip Emmy, I believe. You have five minutes. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Elaine Emmy, and Phil Emmy is here. I'll just make a couple of comments, and then he will. Um, I'm a smog refugee from LA and a smog refugee from Salt Lake City, though I grew up in Bloomington. I came back here to retire for, guess what, <clears throat> clean air, but it's been rather elusive since we got here. When you ask if there were any businesses on Zoom, I'd like to say I am a business. My business is my health, and my health has been damaged by the constant use of blowers and mowers and all the material that gets blown into the air. Um, after we moved here, we built a little patio onto our condo, which we find we can rarely use because when we go outside, the air quality is so poor from what's being thrown around as well as the noise. So often we walk outside with a tray of food only to turn around and come right back in. And not only that, when we go back inside, we have lovely windows, but they're kind of old. And all that air quality problem comes into our house. So I am not happy and I would love to see some solutions. And I think there are progressions. We went from horses to cars and that was sort of a progression. And now we're moving into the world of electric motors. I think this is something that would be great if the city can do to enhance and help with that move incentives as Mr. Kramer said many other cities have already done this, sometimes decades ago, and we call ourselves an environmental city. So I think we can do better. Thank you very much. Thank you for your yes, comment. Philip. Oh. Yes, please go ahead. Philip here. Hello, you wanted to write a comment? Uh, Philip Emmy here. Um, I'd like to speak to this more from a policy point of view. I think uh, the arguments uh, that have been brought forward about the need for regulation are very substantial. And I would very much wish that the uh, committee would investigate the kinds of solutions that are implied in many locations around the country. Uh, there are numerous cities that have approached this issue and found resolutions. Um, and I don't hear any discussion of that in this forum. I'm quite disappointed at the nature of the questioning that's been going on. Uh, they seem to be uh, pointed to the justification of continued polluting activity rather than the search out for decent policy actions. Okay. So I would recommend that you put your staff to work to find how, how this problem has been solved in other locations and get on to working on that. There are many approaches here. Um, I would suggest that some of the land could be used for some of the uh, taxes that we put on land might be used to help address this problem. And beyond that, I'm not sure I have much more to say. Thank you. Other, we love living in Bloomington. Thank you for your comment. Uh, in, any further comment? We, in, we do have another Zoom uh, uh, well, commenter, Julie Gass. <clears throat> okay, Ms. Gass. I'm Julie Gass. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. It's on my computer. 
I'm actually Julie Gass. I'm Glenn Gass. We're, we're married and we agree. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Is yes, you, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, look, uh, first I want to thank you, Framer, for bringing this to our attention and just bringing this issue up. Um, you know, just a quick web search, just a little while ago, I mean, I'm coming up with these things here. This is the Washington Post, 2013, 10 years ago. If you're concerned about air pollution out of your tailpipe, you should be concerned about your gas-powered leaf mower. I mean, come on, like you said in an, an email, um, we were fine 30 years ago with rakes and stuff. I mean, but, you know, no people have to make a business but and make a living, but um, I feel like we're talking past each other. Somebody brought up in the head that noise is the real issue, not just the pollution that we're all breathing in, which is a real issue too. But, uh, you know, my wife and I, like <clears throat> previous speakers said, you know, we've had to leave our screen in porch because we don't want to hear three leaf blowers and two lawnmowers all going at nine o'clock at night in the summer when it's still light out. You know, I mean, come on, give me a break. One of the one of the pleasures of being a Hoosier is sitting on your porch and relaxing. Yeah, yeah. Could, could this end at a certain time of day? Could this only be certain times of the year? Why are people blowing anything in January? Right? So it's just very frustrating to see all this get lost in this talk of gas and fact. I know that's all important, it's essential, but, but you know, the, the basic issue of just sort of noise pollution is an issue too. I couldn't go out there and have a rock band in my backyard and bother everybody without the police coming. But for some reason, we can have all this going on and we're just, we have to shout over leaf blowers. We just leave the porch. We just go inside. So uh, I'm a Hoosier. I want to enjoy my damn porch. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would, would, your, would your wife like to comment too? or? Uh, I don't want to cut anyone off. Oh, you cut yourself off. I can't hear you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, I agree with what he said. No, okay. okay. All right. Thanks for your comment. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'd like, and to, thanks for your I'd like to make a quick comment. Yeah. There are more facets to this issue, you know, than yes. Been yes, there's a lot to consider, and I appreciate it. There is the sound uh, aspect, so. Yeah. Please introduce yeah, thank yourself. Thank you, and, and it's been helpful to hear everybody's perspective here. If, if we're talking about... Could you um, introduce yourself? Just oh, so sure. I'm, I'm Deb Kramer. Okay. Um, I work at Indiana University and used to work at the city a long time ago. But um, I, um, if we're talking about some possible reasonable uh, legislation or restrictions or something I'd like to also advocate not just for time of day perhaps but also holidays I mean we really have had two years ago Christmas Eve when we were planning on spending the day doing Christmas Eve kinds of things we had eight hours or more of leaf blowing in the property behind us and you can't block it out of the house you can't block out the sound and you know someone I, I I don't know if it was a company, I don't know if it was the people, but it was incredibly annoying at a time that should have been a really important family time. And we've had it on Thanksgiving, we've had it on, on um, New Year's Eve, so I would advocate for some restrictions on holidays. Um, I would agree with uh, Glenn and Julie about um, some kind of evening restrictions, because we really have stopped eating on our porch, we stopped having a, you know, a glass of wine on our porch, I'll go out in the morning to have a cup of tea, and sometimes I get to have it, and a lot of times I don't. And it, it just seems unfair that we're having to restrict our lives into the interior of our home because of that. Um, and then I just think about, you know, it used to be in the fall, you know, we live in this incredible community. I think about the campus, it's one of the prettiest places. And I don't, I don't like walking across campus in the fall because I have to walk around the leaf blowers. You can't, I don't like walking my dog in the neighborhood as much because they have to deal with the leaf blowers. And so there's just a huge quality of life things. The electric blowers don't make, they're not as bad in sound um, and I get, the technology needs to improve for you all to be able to be comfortable with them. I hope that can happen fast. I hope that there can be some possible restrictions in the meantime, but um, it's a huge quality of life issue. And 
So I'm, I'm all for reasonable restrictions on it. I, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you for your comment. Uh, I don't see anyone else here that's making comments. So or do we have any comments in the chat? Uh, we did have a comment from um, Michael Hall, uh, who says operations cost for gas-powered groundskeeping equipment is about 10 times that of battery-powered equipment. Uh, clean air lawn care changes their batteries using solar collectors on the truck roofs. A great model for sustainable charging of gas leaf blowers and other lawn care equipment. This solves the issue of battery, uh, battery charging on the job. Uh, and that was all, all he had to say. Okay, and that's all the ch chats? Yep. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that will conclude public comments. Actually, I would like um, to say one more thing. I do, every time I walk by somebody using a leaf blower, and I know that they're doing that as part of their job, I worry about how, much, how aware they are of the health implications. And I don't think we're going to see it right away in terms of health bills or that kind of thing, because these are long-term pollution, you know, long-term toxic effects. But I just, I worry about people... Um, and I know that seems silly, it's their choices, but I also just worry how much they're aware of what they might be doing. When I took this 100 decibel reading <clears throat> that I sent to you, which is um, double the, um, the damaging range, I walked into this bubble like of these toxins and within literally a few seconds, my eyes were burning, my nose was burning, same thing happened. <coughs> It's just, it's unbelievable <laughs> how toxic these things are. Same thing happened. I was on a walk in Bryant Park, 7.30 a.m., and I called the mayor because, called the mayor's office because 7.30 a.m., Sunday morning, the city was blowing Bryant Park with two gas blowers. 7.30 a.m., when you know that these things, a quarter of a mile is, they are clearly audible. There are hundreds of of um, houses around there trying to sleep, worked hard all week like us. We just want to relax on the weekend. That's over. And here they are, 7.30 a.m. On Sunday morning, the city was blowing. And I walked, he was blowing inside of one of, one of the uh, shelters. And I walked in there and it was as if I had just put a bag over my head with exhaust fumes go unbelievable the guy had no respiratory protection he had no hearing protection and I got in touch with the city immediately and I said number one 7 30 a.m. on a Sunday and they said well that's you know they need to keep <laughs> they need to keep it clean okay and okay I, th I, I think we've got the uh, your meeting it's coming up on 7 30 okay that we're gonna need to conclude soon so um, I appreciate all the comments. There's a lot to consider here, obviously. There's, uh, you know, the, the, the type of engines, the type of equipment, um, the, the feasibility of phasing it out, the, the restrictions on time, perhaps, or timing. Uh, these are all things to consider. And I think uh, Mr. Gass said, uh, uh, you know, why are we discussing uh, policy? Uh, I think that's for future discussion. So I'd like to maybe... Uh, if the committee would like to have any concluding comments, I think that we should go to scheduling soon, unless you have more further questions. I don't want to cut anyone off, but we have been at it for an hour and a half. Uh, Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Well, just in response to Mr. Emmy, we we do, our, our staff has been working hard and uh, garner, gathered all kinds of um, ordinances from other cities that was in our packet for the November 29th meeting. Um, so we, we are looking at what other cities have done, so just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I'm sorry I misspoke. That's Mr. Emmy, not Mr. Cass. So, uh, Councilmember Flaherty, do you have any closing thoughts? Cl closing thoughts, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks again for sharing the meeting and to all the feedback and comments we've gotten in discussion, as well as comments from the public. Um, I don't think we're... There's, too much disagreement about where we're headed. The question is kind of how to get there, you know, and, and on what timelines. I think there's a lot more information to gather on some aspects of this. Um, in particular, I, I'd like to engage uh, Indiana University and the school district, uh, the school corporation, um, and possibly the county government on what their plans and goals are. Um, I think this is an area where government can lead uh, because we have a sort of broader purview and, and set of uh, 
considerations that, that we're considering in city operations in particular. Um, but I think IU in particular we can learn from because they've been implementing this for the, the vast majority of their at least handheld equi equipment um, uh, stock at the IUPUI campus. So there's probably uh, things we can learn there. Yeah. IU Bloomington not so much. I used yeah. to have a, yeah. an office on yeah. campus and would have, yes, uh, <laughs> a lot of equipment going on outside my window at certain times of, of day and year. Um, I think we can learn from other cities as well. Uh, I've looked at a lot of the regulation that is out there. There's a lot of time restrictions. Um, you know, time, uh, you know, I think it's entirely reasonable to consider uh, holidays, uh, possibly a weekend day, uh, times early in the morning or late at night where decibel levels of a certain amount, specifically clarified for certain types of equipment, uh, you know, should be within our consideration. Uh, so I think that's reasonable in the near term. Um, I'd like to speak to more uh, cities or have staff speak with more cities about their experience with complete bans. Uh, phase outs to complete bans of gas blowers in particular or two stroke engine uh, equipment using two stroke engines. So uh, I'm aware of at least, uh, I've spoken with the sustainability director in the city of Evanston uh, who said they had a pretty challenging time with um, enforcement uh, when it was first introduced. I don't think they had a very long phase in timeline. I spoke with her a second time about it and I think it's been going better um, uh, this year or more recently. Uh, still very uh, sort of ad hoc enforcement. I, it, she didn't really have a great sense of, um, you know, how how effective it, it truly was if, if, if companies had switched over or not. The other one um, that I uh, am interested in learning more about is, is uh, Washington, D.C. has a, a complete and outright ban as of January 1st, 2022. They enacted that in 2018, so it was a little over a three-year phase in timeline. Um, you know, a relatively uh, similar climate to ours. Uh, you know, not that Evanston's all that different either. But I think learning a little bit more about the experiences of others, including, um, you know, how, how are the businesses there faring? How are they managing this transition? Uh, what is it that they do? That they did they have to buy more batteries? Did you know? I know there's typically rebates or incentives to help ease that transition um, that most governments are offering as well, uh, which is something that's on the table for us. So I think that that kind of detail uh, on on you know, learning from cities that have actually implemented this and what their experience has been is, is uh, something I'd like to explore further as we consider a variety of policy options um, on, on, yeah, a phase out timeline for certain types of equipment possibly. Okay, that's it for me. Great, thank you. Uh, further closing comments from council members? As I, again, I'm just going to say thanks and um, send me an email if you want to add anything to it and make another point. Send me an email. Um, I'll respond and make sure I understand what's going on because um, it's it's it is a comp it's a hard thing and I know it's annoying for people and but but I we're trying to be really cognizant in gathering it from the bottom up and finding out all the things that uh, go into it and not make a decision from the top down. I, so can we're, I add, we're, we're trying to do this the right way. It's, I, I'd like to really stress it's not annoying. It's a severe health issue, yeah, both Mr. mentally and Mr. physically. Yep, we understand that. <laughs> okay, I, I've heard that very badly about him. Yeah, it's, an, it's, a, it's a definitely a consideration of ours. Councilmember Piedmont Smith, anything to conclude? Um, I'd just like to thank the, the business owners and uh, for their input. I don't think this will be the last opportunity for input. So please, um, you know, if we don't have your emails yet, please um, let our uh, council attorney know so that we can keep in touch. Yeah. I'd also like to thank members of the public um, who have advocated on this. I think it's important to bring this up and certainly since it's on, in our climate action plan I think it, you know it was on our radar but it, it helps for to have people push pushing for it and I can empathize with um, the annoyance of not being able to use your porch because we are Hoosiers we love our porches so uh, that's it okay well I have very little to add except that <laughs> like Councilmember Flaherty I'm interested in how this was done in other communities and uh, how, the, how they met the challenge of uh, what has been discussed this evening about uh, hardship to, to the affected businesses. Um, and I'm interested in the regulation of 
time of use. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the health effects too, because I think that we've, that's a point of agreement of everybody here is that two stroke engines cause significant pollution and it affects especially people who are, who have compromised lungs and, and so forth, <coughs> asthma and, and other, other problems. So let's go to scheduling before we adjourn. Um, when would we like to meet again? We, we could meet a month from now on the 21st of March, uh, if not sooner. Um, is there any? Are you picturing the next meeting being primarily for discussion of policy yes. options? Um, yeah, I think we've taken in a lot of information mm -hmm. here, and I think that we need to maybe uh, ruminate on that and then uh, come into some sort of discussion mode where we, mm -hmm. and, and, and perhaps explore a bit more about mm -hmm. how this transition w it was made in other cities and, and what a time frame could be. Uh, and also maybe re regulating time of use to find out if uh, you know what other cities are doing about that and and of course keeping everybody here informed as to that because we want to continue this discussion with you um, uh, does that sound fair I think uh, a meeting on those topics sounds good I'm also interested in bringing in uh, in particular I IU uh, staff mm -hmm. and um, possibly the MCCSC and county government as well to, to engage yeah. with, with city government staff and talk about this uh, around the idea of, of, you know, shared goals and commitments as well as exp experiences in particular in the case of IU. And the 21st is not a good day. No, <laughs> I was just going to say, I, 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 I bet you and I have the same well, thing. But, but okay. Before we go to that, let's... No, I, I will mention we did send an invite to uh, IU, MCCSC, the county, uh, so if, if we are hoping to find a date that works for all of those groups, it, it may not make sense to pick a date right this second, okay. just because we may need to reach out and check with their availability, so. Let's do a doodle poll then, based upon, do some outreach, find out what, when it's good for them, and, and we can decide then. Happy to help coordinate that. Okay. And, and of course, the folks here in the room and anyone else we've heard from, if you'd like to leave your contact info, I, I imagine you all got the email about this meeting already, but uh, just to confirm, if you'd like to leave your your email addresses, we'll, we'll be happy to keep you in the loop and let you know about any other meetings coming up. Yeah. And I would also say I'd, I'd reach out to the rental companies in town and then also construction companies. Yeah. Concrete. concrete. Yeah, concrete manufacturer and just construction in general. Very good. Okay. Any other business? Then I'll adjourn the meeting and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.